dark, cold, and dreary. Those are the only words I can come up with to describe the house in which I had lived with my family for the majority of my life. Mostly dark, blistering cold during the winter, and always eerie. Sometimes there would be strange noises coming from the cellar, too. It had often given me the creeps, though I would never admit that to my mother. I'd figured I was too old to let some silly noises scare me anyway. I had been trying to act like the man of the house ever since my dad left when I was seven. I had always hoped I would never turn out like my father, whom I hated with a burning passion. As far as he goes, I suppose I'd better just leave it at that. I lived in the house with my mother, Linda, and my uncle, Kevin, on a vast piece of land in Steinen, Indiana. Steinen was a tiny piece of shit in the middle of nowhere. Nobody liked living there. I didn't have any friends because I was homeschooled, and I'd never even seen another kid my age in Steinen since we almost never left the house unless my mom had to go into town to buy groceries. However, I was always very close to my Uncle Kevin. When I was little, he would tell me ghost stories right before bed, which my mother hated. Stop, Stop it, it Kev. Kev. You're, You're going, going to, to give, give him nightmares. nightmares. She would snap. Oh, I did get nightmares indeed. And sometimes it seemed as though the nightmares refused to end. They crept into the back of my mind like a spider crafting its web. The story he told most often was one about a monster with a contorted body and black eyes. According to the legend, as Uncle Kevin called it, even though I knew he made it up himself, the monster would come into your room if you were awake past your bedtime and hide in your closet watching you the whole night. Of course, this was just a silly little tell that Kevin would tell me so I wouldn't stay up late. Even so, I can't tell you how many times that horrible creature has popped into my head over the years. On this particular night, I decided to go to bed early in an attempt to sleep off a pounding headache. I lied down on my icy bed and sank underneath the covers, hiding my face from whatever may have been lurking inside of my head. After setting my glasses down on the nightstand beside my bed, I reached over and flicked the light off. The darkness made me feel alive in a very strange way, almost as though I was mesmerized by the nothingness. As I looked around the room, seeing almost nothing but the pitch black darkness surrounding me, I felt entranced, as if something was forcing me to look. Of course there was nothing to look at, at least not with my eyes. This was something you could only witness within the deepest corridors of your mind. The part of your mind that you always dread visiting and can never seem to return from. Out of nowhere, I began to hear scratches upon the window above my bed. My eyes immediately burst open, and I felt like I was unable to close them again. What, what the, the fuck, fuck was, was that? that? I asked myself. Nothing, of course. It was nothing. It couldn't have been anything, right? Right. Just my mind playing tricks on me in the dark. No big deal. But, in a moment of childish curiosity, I decided to peer out the window just to make sure I was hearing nothing more than a tree branch brushing against the glass. But then it hit me like a bag of bricks. There was no tree next to my window. Still I decided it would be better to sleep it off and think more about it in the morning. It was probably all in my head. It had to be. I found it unusually difficult to fall asleep that night, as if somebody or something was trying to keep me up. I woke up the next morning with that sound still locked in my brain. It had to have been coming from somewhere, but where? Shit, I had no idea. But then I remembered the cellar. I built up as much courage as I could muster and slowly crept down into the abyss. Jesus, I hadn't been down there in a year, maybe longer. I had almost forgotten what it looked like. Nothing but clouds of cobwebs and stacks of cardboard boxes shoved against the walls. I rustled through a couple of boxes until I stumbled upon a picture I'd drawn when I was a child. It was a sketch of a grotesque creature. It definitely wasn't human. This thing barely even had a face. Just dark black eyes and no mouth. Its body was tall and thin and was contorted into a shape that I had never even seen before. 
The more I looked at the drawing, the more I was reminded of that story my uncle used to tell me. It appeared to be raining above the creature, and towards the bottom of the paper I had scribbled, Please stay awake, in giant letters. I didn't know what the hell that was supposed to mean, but I folded up the paper and stuffed it in my pocket. I quickly made my way up the staircase into the kitchen and went about my day as usual, keeping that drawing in my mind, trying to remember what it meant and why I'd drawn it in the first place. I looked outside and noticed that it had begun to rain. I didn't want to think about that creature any longer, so I walked into my dimly lit room and plopped onto my bed. I fell asleep before I even knew it. When I awoke, it was exactly 3 o'clock a.m. This night was colder and darker than usual. The farm was soaked from rain from earlier in the evening. The moon was full and radiant. It almost didn't look real. For an instant, I glanced out of my bedroom window, and I could swear I saw something walking quickly through the yard. When it spotted me, it slunk behind a tree as if it were trying to hide from me. It looked exactly like what I had drawn when I was a child. I ran into Uncle Kevin's room and began shaking him awake. Kevin! Kevin! He rubs the room out of his eyes. What's up, bud? It's late. He asked, bewildered at my excitement. I looked him in his bloodshot eyes and softly said, I saw someone in the yard. Kevin looked at me with hesitation. No, you probably just saw an animal. Get back to bed. I know what I saw. This was no animal. Or at least, not one that I had ever seen. Not even in my worst fucking nightmares. I knew I couldn't tell him exactly what I had seen. As he would never believe me. No, Kevin, it was not an animal. Please. It was a man... I mean, I think, look, just please go out and check. Uncle Kevin leapt up and grabbed his shotgun from under the bed. All right, come on, show me where he is. Let's try not to wake your mom. I'll scare the fucker off. We went outside and I pointed to the tree. I whispered to Kevin, I saw him go behind that tree. My uncle bravely walked up to the tree and peered around it. Nothing. He searched the entire farm for well over half an hour, but he never found anyone or anything. Let's go back in, bud. There's no one out here. Keep the doors locked, it. He was wrong. I knew there was something out there. I crawled into bed and threw the covers over my face. I could hear the blistering wind coming from outside. It pierced my ears with a whistle that I thought only dogs could detect. Suddenly, I heard a tapping sound upon my window. The sound grew louder with each tap. I tightened the blankets around my body. The taps slowly turned into knocks. Louder and faster the knocks became. The knocks turned into bangs. I thought the glass was going to break. Then, out of nowhere, it stopped. No more taps. No more knocks. No more bangs. No more wind. I was relieved. Suddenly, I heard a low, chilling voice in my ear. Please, stay awake. It couldn't be. No, it couldn't be. I ran into the hallway ready to make my way to my mother's room when I saw it. Whatever it was, I still don't know. It was holding Kevin's lifeless mangled body in its arms, carved deeply into my uncle's torso were the words, please stay awake. I tried to let out a scream, but only silence filled the dead air. I sprinted through the door of my mother's bedroom and saw her body lying in the middle of the floor. She was covered in blood, and her left arm had been ripped straight out of its socket. Written next to her in her own blood were the words, Please stay awake. I began to sob, and when I turned around, the creature was gone. I don't know where the hell it went, 
and I'm not sure I want to. I closed my eyes as tightly as I could and let out the loudest scream I could muster. I called the police and lied down on the cold, now blood-soaked floor waiting for them to arrive. It felt like hours. Finally, the police showed up to find me in the fetal position next to my mother's corpse. I told them everything I saw. I showed them my drawing. I told them about the taps, the knocks, the bangs. I told them what I'd seen outside, but of course they wouldn't hear a word of it. Why would they? All they could see was a lonely kid hovering over his dead mother, her blood covering my clothes almost as much as it covered the floor. It's cold in this cell. It's dark and lonely. The silence is the only saving grace. Constant, peaceful silence. Tonight, it's raining outside. It's colder, darker, and wetter than ever. But unfortunately, I must stop writing now. I just heard a tap on my window. The house I grew up in was right next to a set of busy railroad tracks. From my bedroom window, I could watch the trains roll by. There were three types of trains that used those tracks and still do to this day. There were the long, lumbering freight trains pulling boxcars, flatbeds, and tankers, which I would try and count as they clattered by. Then there were the fast-moving commuter trains of the Metropolitan Area Transmit Authority, aka MADA, or the M, as some people call it, and Amtrak passenger trains that would breeze by, heading to and from the central station in the heart of the city. Now, when most people see trains, they just see big machines rolling down ribbons of steel. But me? I saw trains as symbols of freedom and a way out of the hood. Whenever I saw a train, I could imagine all the places it was going to and coming from. Naturally, my favorite toys as a tyke were my Thomas the Tank Engine toys. I had all the characters, Thomas, Percy, Gordon, James, Toby, Daisy, all of them. When I was 10, my grandparents bought me a Lionel train set for my birthday. To me, it was the best present ever. It consisted of a steam engine and four passenger cars. There was even a small bottle of drops you'd put in the smokestack that allowed the engine to make smoke. I'd spend hours watching that toy train run in an oval, pretending it was real, and I was driving the locomotive through forests, past fields, across mountains, and past small towns. I eventually developed other interests, namely girls, but I still never lost interest in trains. When I got older, I applied for a job as an engineer trainee on Meta, and got it. For me, it was a dream come true. After I took the required classroom courses and exams, I soon found myself riding in the cab of the sleek diesel engines that pull the commuter trains. Now the way the training program was set up was that you'd have to ride on the different lines of the system for a few months with a regular engineer. I'd be on one line for a few weeks, and then I'd be assigned to another line, in order to be familiar with the different routes. The M has eight routes, all numbered. The main line is line 1, and all the branch lines are line 2, line 3, and so on. I started on line 7 the first few weeks before being moved to line 8. Now line 8, or the Cloverton line as it is sometimes called, is one of the longest branch lines on the system, second only to line 2, aka the Millersport line. The first time I rode on line 8, I was with a veteran engineer named Hank. Now, Hank had been with the company from the beginning, when the old railroads decided they wanted out of the money-losing commuter services, and handed all of their locomotives and rolling stock to MADA. We had the Night Owl service, which starts at 7pm and ends at 5 in the morning. We picked up our first passengers at Central Station and were soon on our way to Cloverton. As we were going down the track, Hank turned to me and said, 
There is something you should know if you're going to be working for this railroad, especially if they decide to put you here on Line 8 once they make you an official engineer. I looked at him and said, Oh, and what's that? Hank paused to blow the horn for a crossing, and then said, This land is haunted. I replied, Haunted? How is the line haunted? Hank looked at me and said, It supposedly started with a curse. Back in the late 1800s, when one of the old railroad companies was building the line, the company built the line across the edge of an old farm that belonged to a man named Ezra Gray without his permission. Ezra demanded that the railroad remove the tracks from his property and relay them somewhere else, but the railroad refused, due to it costing too much time and money to do so. Mr. Gray did try to sue the railroad, but was unsuccessful. You see, railroads were quite powerful back in those days, and the railroad had a lot of politicians and judges in their pocket. To add insult to injury, Ezra not only had to pay the court costs, but had to pay the railroad as well, for all the money they spent on the legal proceedings. This bankrupted Ezra, and he was forced to sell the farm, minus the small patch of land the track were built upon and Ezra Gray vowed to get even one way or another. When the line later opened up, Ezra stood on the tracks in front of the first train. The engineer tried to stop in time, but Ezra was hit anyway. Before he died, Ezra cursed the line, saying that it would bring death and sorrow. Ever since then, there were a lot of mishaps and accidents on these tracks, and many people lost their lives. It is believed that some of those who died haunt various spots and that a few of the trains that crashed over the years come back as ghost trains, still rolling along these very rails we're on now. I looked at Hank as he blew the horn for another crossing. Have you seen any ghosts on this line? I asked. Plenty, he said. I've seen everything from headless trainmen to phantom lads and ghost trains. I didn't believe him at first, but didn't say anything. We eventually came to a curve in the track, and when we came out of it, I saw something that made my blood freeze. Coming at us was the headlight of another train. Hank, for God's sake, man, put the brakes on! I shouted. Don't you see the other train coming our way? Hank responded. Yeah, I see it. Don't worry, we'll be fine. I looked at Hank and screamed. Are you crazy? We're about to die! Hank just pointed straight ahead and said, No, we're not. Get a good look at that train. I did, and saw that not only did the oncoming engine have the shape of one of the older type diesels, like you see in photos, movies, and TV shows from the 50s and 60s, but it seemed to be a transparent shadow with a headlight and lighted cab windows. What the? I started to say, but when that shadow train hit us, well, not hit us exactly, more like passed through us. Our whole cab was surrounded by shadows and streaks of light as what looked to be a passenger train passed through. And I swear I saw the pale wispy figures of people sitting in the seats. Soon it was gone, and the cab of our engine returned to normal. What the hell was that? I exclaimed. Hank turned to me and said, That was one of the ghost trains I was talking about. Well, what's the story with that ghost train? I asked. Hank sighed and said, Well, it all happened shortly after Matta was established and took over the commuter rail lines. An evening inbound train had just crested the long grade we're on right now, 
when it lost control and ran away all downhill before crashing and piling up on the curve at the bottom. Everyone on board was killed, and the cause of the wreck was blamed on the Asian equipment Mata was using back then. Heck, with only a few exceptions, most of the engines Mata got from the old railroads were 25 to 30 years old, and about 30% of the coaches used were even older. Not long afterward, the ghosts of that train started making appearances along this stretch of track, becoming one of the several ghost trains that haunt these rails. I looked at him, then out the front window of the engine. What about the people back in the cars? Do you think they just saw what we saw? I asked. Hank just shrugged and said, Probably, but I'm sure most of them are used to it, so I wouldn't worry too much. Our conductor is probably taking care of things right now. We continued on to Cloverton and arrived on time. We made runs back and forth all night, and several times I saw some of the scary things that Hank told me about. I was relieved when we finally tied up in the yard, leaving the coaches on one of the side tracks and put the engine in the roundhouse. The next few nights, however, were hell. Every night run, I had at least a few creepy encounters along Line 8, all of them with Hank, who would just shrug them off as if they were nothing. But I guess that after nearly 40 years, none of the ghosts bothered him anymore. After a few days, I was put on the day runs, which was a relief to me, and I didn't have to worry about seeing ghost trains or headless trainmen again. I eventually became a regular engineer and was put on the main line run. I'm pretty content, but if the big wigs for the M ever decide to put me on the Line 8 Night L service, I'll quit. The swirl of voices awoke Jared from his troubled sleep. Farah, his wife, was disturbed only by his tossing and turning. She couldn't hear the voices. They were in his head. A senseless drone of overlapping whispers, faint but present, troubled his mind. He could discern no sense or message, just noise. Naturally, he told nobody about the recent onset of this affliction. He rose from bed, approached the window, and stared off into his backyard, partly illuminated by the neighbor's annoying motion-detecting flood lamp. Here by the window, it seemed that the noises became more distinct, or perhaps louder. Instead of senseless swirl, he was now able to sense the definite rhythm of speech. Jared stood and focused intently, but still couldn't make anything out. The timer on the neighbor's light ran out abruptly blotting out the view. As Jared's eyes adjusted to the deepened dark, the voices seemed to come into sharper focus. Words seemed to emerge, their forms lost in the overlapping sounds. He looked over his shoulder at his still sleeping wife. Her obese worm-like body held no appeal to him and had him for some time. At first, he drowned out his frustration in alcohol, but the fire of a man's lust cannot be quenched by drink only temporarily dulled. Looking over Vera's lumpy and rotund form, his affair now seemed an inevitability. After all, we only live once, and a man his age shouldn't be expected to settle for sexless inebriation, especially if he could have Nisa. The thought of her fired his mind, that flaming red hair and those seductive green eyes. Hers was an otherworldly beauty, Fair alabaster skin, taut and supple, alluring curves neither too slight nor too exaggerated. He longed to experience her body, and his desire was only amplified by her refusal to fully submit. She explained that she didn't want to ruin his marriage, didn't want to be the other woman. Ruin his marriage? Other woman? Compared to her, there might as well be no other women. He'd made promises and offers, everything and anything she could want. But still, she'd always held back and refused. Wait. Wait. She'd said. 
the persistent voices wouldn't let him rest. Taking in one last look at Vera's bulk spread across the bed, he snorted his disgust and left the room for the kitchen where he poured himself a stiff drink. Perhaps a buzz could quiet the racket in his head and let him rest. The brown liquid burned his throat, but did nothing to quiet his head. Again Nisa's long frizzy hair and shiny lips pressed into his mind. He couldn't stop thinking about her. But of course he couldn't. Such was the nature of infatuation. He downed his drink, poured another, reached for his cell phone, and typed in the memorized number. Miss you. He typed into the text box and pressed send. Minutes later, Jared's cell lit up and slowly dimmed, indicating the receipt of a text. Anxiously but clumsily, he reached for the device and read the message. Miss you too. Sup, babe? Eventually, his numb fingers were able to pound out a response. <laughs> Not much. Can't sleep. Her response came quickly. I have something that might help you sleep. Question mark. He typed back. Why don't I come by and show you? That gave Jared pause. He checked the time. 12.34. He was late. No doubt he could slip out without Vera hearing, but he had work in the morning, and staying up late would make it all the worse tomorrow. Then again, he was already up, and how could he pass the opportunity to stroke that skin, to taste those lips? Maybe tonight she'd finally surrender to him. Why deny such pleasure to lessen future misery? It's a date. He typed back. Be there in ten. Ten minutes till heaven, he mused. Plenty of time for one more drink. He stumbled down the street towards the agreed meeting place. He could see her black Ford parked near a streetlight. As he ambled along, he saw her interior light go on as Nisa stepped out of the car to meet him. She was a sight to behold in a flowing pink dress. The top plunged deeply at the neck, advertising her full cleavage, and the bottom was just short enough to reveal the tops of her stockings, the clasps of her garter belt, and the flawless white of her thighs. She stood daintily as he eagerly approached her. Have you been drinking? She asked in a catty manner. Jared held up his hands. Am I that obvious? I can tell. She responded. It's in your face and eyes. Without hesitation, she approached and wrapped her arms around him, looked alluringly into his eyes, and kissed him sweetly on the mouth. Her body gave no resistance or protest as his hands hungrily explored the smooth curves of her body. Nisa pulled away giggling playfully, smiling at him. So, do you want to get coffee, or just go play somewhere? He asked, hoping of the latter. I was thinking we could go somewhere and talk about us. She hesitated. And maybe play a little. She added with a wicked smirk. A talk, a talk about, about us? us? Jared's addled mind fixated on hopeful thoughts. Sounds like a plan. Hop in. I'll drive. She said. He licked his lips as he watched her hips sway around the hood of the car. It seems like she had been driving for a while, but then he hadn't really been paying attention. The dissonance of the voices continued to swirl in his head and had slowly grown louder, though they didn't drown out any of the ambient sounds of the car, road, or of Nisa's conversation. It was as though they came to him through a separate sense. He wasn't hearing, but experiencing them. The sound of the tires changed from pavement to gravel, 
and Jarge noticed that they were driving down a dirt road without street lamps. Where the hell are we? He slurred out. Just the little town I grew up in. She responded. We're going to a place an old flame used to take me. There will be lots of memories at this place, and I'd like you to be a part of them. She said with a sweet smile. She turned her headlights off and took a hard right down a narrow path into the woods. The way ahead illuminated only by the running red lights. After bouncing with the Ford suspension for a few hundred feet, Nisa stopped the car and looked at Jared. I've been doing some thinking, and I've come to some decisions about us. Jared looked at her hopefully. Nisa continued, looking at him seriously. I think it's time you left her. Jared couldn't conceal the joy on his face. And I think we should start fresh together. She leaned across him, bracing herself with one hand on his hip as she opened the glove box and pressed the trunk release button. She winked at him and got out of the car. He climbed out of the passenger door and met her by the now open trunk. When I was a kid, we used to come here to cuddle by the fire and watch the sun rise. I want to experience that again tonight. She gripped his hand and squeezed. And be together. She pulled a shovel from the trunk and led him to a place on the ground. But first, we need to dig a fire pit so that we don't burn down the whole forest. She handed him the shovel and pointed at the spot. So please, dig. Jared thought it odd, but a fire would be romantic and he would do anything to possess her. As he cleared away the leaves and branches where Nisa had pointed, the voices began pounding in his head. Louder, more insistent, yet clearer than ever. I'll gather some wood, she said from behind him. As the spade cut into the soft ground, the internal din intensified. With each shovelful, Jared became more aware that the voices were all speaking the same words, only disunited. As the hole widened and deepened, they moved more into harmony, making the speech more clear to grasp but harder to understand, as if an echo were overpowering its own origin. Jared worked with greater ferocity, driven to finally understand. The blade of the shovel smashed through buried sticks and rocks and squelched into the ground, turned damp, then wet. The voices became a deafening chorus, and the shovel struck something unyielding. Jared bent and found the ground muddy and liquid, as though he were standing in a swamp. Reaching into the mud, his fingers found a large, smooth object. As Jared groped, he noticed the hole was littered not with rocks and sticks, but with bones. Femurs, ulnas, ribs. Some smashed by his shovel, others intact. Jared's fingers found purchase on the smooth object and lifted. He raced it into the moonlight and stared down in fascination as the red-tinged mud dripped away, revealing an elongated, inhuman skull with curling, segmented horns. As he stared into empty eye sockets, the voices finally moved into an echoing, coherent scream in his mind. Jared's focus broke as pain struck. Blood poured from the deep slash across his throat, spilling to the ground and onto the horned skull. As his life drained and his vision blurred, it seemed that a blackened tongue slid out of the skull's mouth and lapped at the flowing red eye core. The voices fell silent as his lifeless body joined the tangle of corpses in the mass grave. Nisa's delicate fingers wiped the knife clean and lifted the skull up to her face. She gently stroked its contours, smearing Jared's blood onto the dry, thirsty bone. Not enough yet. That's soon, my love. 
She kissed the toothy skeletal grin, staining her lips red. Carefully, gently, she placed the skull back on the blood-soaked ground and set to work filling in the hole. The fresh kill would help feed and restore him, but more was needed, and she would bring it. <laughs>